Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Q&A with the producer and director of The Curse of Willow Song, uh, Karen Wong and Karen Lamb. Welcome. Uh, I am Larry Collicut from here in Fredericton. My friends call me Lair, and I prefer to be called that way because I like everybody to be my friend. The, uh, um, <clears throat> so the, there's a lot going on in this movie. I, I really like this movie. I, there, there's so many layers and things to this. And Karen, I've been thinking about our conversation a week or so ago as to how to ask you the first question that won't force you into that awkward position of having to try to reimagine the answer that you give every time. So I'm going to, instead of asking you where this movie came from, I want to ask you a, a very particular question about something that starts very early on into the movie. There's a moment where Willow says to flee in, in, in the boarding house, I think we're pretty lucky. And that was a really key moment in a, mov in, in a movie about a curse. So instead of asking you where this, where this idea came from, I want to ask you where that line came from. You know, with all of the dialogue, um, it tends to come almost as a I call it stream of conscious. I, I literally just channel my characters. So wherever that line came from, it came from some deep ether sort of stuff. So I don't, um, but I mean, it's it, the good thing is obviously not overthinking when you, when, when you do it, it's almost like I take dictation from my characters once it, once it goes. So. I, I love that, that, that really caught my attention because like when I, I said, when we talked last week, the, there's so many things going on here and where, um, this is the curse of Willow Song is a father's nightmare. It's for, for me, I look at it like I have two daughters and the thoughts of either of my children having to live in that situation and be on the street, you know, and then face, face everything that they have and then potentially becoming that old woman who's screaming at the people that just kicked her out. There's, 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 a, there's, there's a lot going on. So that thing that, that I think we're pretty lucky. It really kind of, it, that, that kind of, kind of stuck with me there's there's so many terrible people in this movie <laughs> from from that terrible probation officer um to the uh, uh the, that absolutely evil construction manager who I, I really think somebody should have just taken out back and dealt with the <laughs> it, uh, there are some there's some there's, there's some really deep things going on there about homelessness and about drug addiction um the uh so what was the inspiration behind that, using that part to tell this story about Willow's Curse? Well, you know, we do, uh, Karen and I live in Vancouver, and um, homelessness is uh, a significant problem here. If you're going to be homeless anywhere in Canada, you probably would like to be homeless in Vancouver because it's a little bit more temperate. So we tend to have a lot of, you know, um, it's, it's, it's been an ongoing issue. Again, we have warmer winters, and um, apparently we also are the head injury capital of Canada as well. I didn't realize this until I was doing some research, but there's a lot of brain injuries. And, um, you know, quite a few years ago, we also closed down some of our mental health facilities. And so there's a lot of people on the street that actually should be in care or in better facilities than, than they are. And so that is unfortunately a reality for us. Just the moment you, you get out onto the street, there are, there are people, the pandemic has also not made it easier for people. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that, that that is something, the vulnerable in our country is something that, you know, I think it happens in every country, but I definitely think we notice it more here in Vancouver. And I wanted to add to that is um, also as people dealing with the opiate crisis, it touches everyone. Like I have personal friends who have died from opiate um, overdoses. Um, in our industry, in the film industry, there's constant, um, because of the high stress, there is actually a lot of mental health issues and um, concern for our people within our industry as well. So there's a lot of people who have, it's easy, the drugs are accessible and, um, and it is a huge crisis and it's touched us for many years in Vancouver. So it's the housing crisis and so forth. Uh, we're always one step away from someone who's living in those conditions. Yes. Yeah. The, it's like exactly. with even bef even before 
this current end of the world that we're living through. I mean, so so many people all all, all across this country, they're, they're one or two paychecks away from being in the same sort of situation that Willow is. And the, 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 the tie-in that uh, I, I love the performance of Flea and Willow. We talked about it last week. That that scene of Flea and Willow on, on, on the street where she's lost her place to stay. She's, she, she's high as all get out. She's burnt out. The, 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 there's so much agony. Now you said, you, you said that uh, you talked about that, uh, that scene that was shot. Could you, go, could you explain that for our viewers here tonight to what, uh, what you said last week? Yeah, um, my process for working with the actors is that I don't do, I won't do a read through. I don't tend to do auditions very often. <laughs> Um, you know, I've worked with Ingrid Nelson, who played Flea, um, you know, for quite a few projects, actually, before this. And uh, my process is usually that we go for coffee and we have a, a discussion about the script. And um, that scene is actually, I had written it, but Ingrid herself had had a very similar experience herself. She was working with a, another young woman and um, hadn't seen her for a few months and was actually driving, saw her on the street and she looked really messed up. Um, you know, just basically said, get in the car, I'll, I'll give you a ride, where do you need to go? And she was so messed up, she was going through her glove compartment and, you know, just basically, and so that pain and that scene was really um, inspired, like, you know, Inger gave me a few more details and I rewrote the scene basically based on a lot of the details. And again, that's what I tried to do over and over again um, in the, in, um, for, for all of my scripts, actually. It's, uh, you take the scene, you've got the bare bones of what it is, but then you work with the actors so that it's not just that they're performing a character, they're bringing something of themselves into that. And that makes it, uh, for me at least, a lot more resonant because they're bringing something. So you were also describing the construction boss. And that scene, I originally wrote that scene to be one of the nicer scenes for my actor, Lewis, who I always kill in every film or severely maim. And so this time around, I was going to give him this, like, Walter was going to be just this bland nothing burger. Um, it's funny because Karen um, called me beforehand because we had a couple of bland nothing burger type, you know, sort of like the, the scene was fine. It just wasn't anything. And Karen called me and said, should we do a Me Too thing here? Like, should we do something with that? And I, I just had the worst Nexus interview ever. So a lot of that transcript is actually my Nexus interview. And I remember calling David and saying, hey, I gave you this really kind of bland scene. Do you want to be a creep? Like, do you, are you cool with that? And he was like, I, I can do that. So we, we sort of ripped a, a bit. I told him about my terrible Nexus interview and he added a few more details. And again, that was it. And so one of the things that I love is that when he starts off, he's talking to his wife and his child, you know, like on the cell phone. That little detail actually makes it worse because for all of us, you know, if we've been in a position like that, that actually soothes us. We think to yourself, oh, you know what? He's fine. He's got a wife. He's got a kid. Everything's okay. Nothing's going to happen to me. And your guard goes down. And then it happens anyway. And you're like, oh, no, not this again. Right? <laughs> it's just like the, and so that, that is very much a part of it. If uh, I often want to make sure that the actors have something that they, if they have something to contribute or a scene resonates with them and they want to add something, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that I, I include that when I, when I do a new draft. Well, that scene resonated with me because but I just wanted to hurt that man. <laughs> it, was, it was terrible because it was another one of those things that I, I watched this from the perspective of a father and thinking of my little girls, you know, because I don't care if they're over 20 now, you know, you know, when, when they're over 30, they're still going to be my little girls. And if a man treats them like that, well, it just isn't going to be fun for that man. So the, I, that, that, that one of, that was one of the, like, one of the things that really kind of stuck out to me was, was that scene because all of the, good people that willow encounters the the artist i mean who would you would think she would be a wonderful person the even the art student was so condescending to her and the probation officer i, I mean i have a friend um, who is an ex-probation officer and I'm, I'm sure she must if she if she's watched this tonight she was going oh dear god what a terrible probation officer that was the it uh, it was just so all those good people were so terrible to Willow and so terrible to the people around. But I think that's what, um, again, I have not set out to do something that was about systemic mm -hmm. racism or, you know, basically it, was, it wasn't supposed to be about white racism. Mm -hmm. It was just the idea that the system, when you're actually in a position like this, 
for all of the rule following and that sort of stuff, they're just little like roadblocks for Willow. So she's just trying to do like get back into society and do the right thing. And again, there's nothing wrong with what anyone is doing. It's just their complete, um, I, I guess, almost like indifference to her position. They're just doing their own thing. You know, like the art student who's just doing her, she's perfectly happy. She's blithe. She's like, you know, she's blind to what Willow is going through. She's perfectly happy. And I think that's what we're coming up again and again against when you're dealing with systemic sort of issues and roadblocks and, and ceilings. It's that nobody's actively necessarily doing something. They're just blind to how your path actually is. They're just, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're in their own little selfish bubbles because that's how people are, you know? Like you don't think twice about like, you know, uh, I, I think about all of us going through our lives, you know, like how many days have you made life worse for someone else inadvertently? <laughs> You know, like you think that you're doing a good thing. And then, you know, there's someone who you've just caught, like, you know, like the art student. I don't think she thought twice about this encounter later on. Like it just was, you know, it's just like, oh yeah, I let her in, you know, I, she, she had to get her stuff. She didn't think about any of these sorts of things and nobody does, you know, you're the, the artist herself, you know, she's doing the right thing. She's given this chance and she feels good about it. Like every time you do these little, um, you know, charity things, you feel good and it's self-congratulatory for you that you've done this for someone else. But, you know, once that, once it becomes an inconvenience to you, that's when it's like, oh, well, I did my share already, <laughs> you know? And so that's what it's, it's, uh, that's what we, I, I at least um, that's what I was channeling this idea that, you know, no one sets out to do terrible things. It's just, it piles up when you see example after example where, you know, people are just selfish or doing, doing their own thing and it's the inadvertence uh inadvertent jerkery that <laughs> i think that's i i think i i think you did a great job of, uh, of displaying that because like we try to go through i've <clears throat> the i i've i made a change in my own life like five or six years ago is that like i don't make fun of anybody anymore I used to be one of those guys, like that was that's a big guy thing like so you say i used to play a lot of sports so it's kind of a jock thing you poke you poke at people and you and you tease people and I, I i i tried to change that because you never know whether you've ruined the best day somebody's had in a long time or if you've just taken the worst day that they've ever had and made it worse so it the, 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 but you, so many of us i'm like i went for like 50 years just not even thinking about that and the uh, i the uh, I'm so glad that I've I've had this opportunity to talk to for you guys because I spotted all these things that just that, that spoke to me from my own life and from my own history. I I've really enjoyed it. The let, uh, your, let, let this Q and A be your therapy session. That's it, it is. It is. It is. I I had this is like ther this is like session two. We had one ten to ten days ago or so, and it was great. I feel so much better. I've come back for more. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh is right like it, i think that um when we do when we tell stories for each other it's about like why are we doing this over and over again like why do we why do we put ourselves into this position of making a film telling a story it's hopefully personifying some something that is um about humanity you know it's it's about seeing ourselves in these characters and um whether again you relate to willow or any of the myriad of other characters you know like again um, they're all based on, unfortunately, real life examples that are exaggerated, but, you know, it's, it's there. And even your, like, there's shades of me too. It's like, you know, God, you know, there's days where you're like, yeah, I did this good thing. You're feeling all smug about yourself. Right. And so that is something where you're critiquing yourself as well. And so it's, um, I think that's hopefully what we try to do in every film, whether it's a horror film or otherwise, is to bring something to life that, you know, hopefully people can relate to. Yeah. The, it, uh, I've got, I want to, I want to switch gears. I, I, I could talk about the, the content of this for, 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 for hours, the, uh, but I want to swing, swing back. And I want to ask uh, Karen Wong a, a question about pulling all of this together from, from the standpoint of producer. Now, the, uh, the, the, one of the coolest things was that, that you brought together was this was your warehouse, right? Did I hear that? Did I understand that correctly? It was a location I had contacts with. You yes. had contacts with you. Yes. But I love that location. The uh, so how did you pull uh, pull on go about? Was it was it a lot of effort? And like, did you have to do anything special to get uh, to get some of these uh, some of these things together? Uh, 
Not really. Like the, my contact owned the warehouse and mm -hmm. actually um, within the warehouse, we were able to build almost every set that we needed for the film. Yeah. And um, except for the exteriors, when we went down, the welding um, uh, shot was at a outside. Um, and I think uh, the tattoo parlor was outside, obviously, but everything else was shot at the warehouse and was dressed like the probation officer's office was a set that we built in the warehouse. Um, oh, okay. And in the warehouse there, it was a creepy warehouse to begin with. The main floor was empty. We always kept it empty. And it was like, if we weren't filming in it, it was our lunchroom. Upstairs where we filmed most of the film um, was, uh, used to be an apartment up there and there was like the remnants of a fireplace uh, shag carpets were pulled up there was bathrooms in there and uh, uh, washing machines it was a very creepy kind of like it was kind of partly demolished and a lot of those toilets that were scattered through were actually there in the warehouse <laughs> We had done very little set deck um, and there was things falling from the ceiling that was already there, like um, HVAC systems that were kind of partly dismantled and um, were just hanging loose. So it was actually um, all ready to go. Uh, we didn't really have to do that much. We brought in a mattress. <laughs> Yes, you would. Yes, I, 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 I'm sure that Valerie didn't want. Wouldn't if there had been a mattress there, she wouldn't have wanted to, to use that. Yeah. <laughs> it, I did. It was it was a great location because the uh, like I noticed the uh, like the stuff that was was hanging and there's there's a there's a great shot of a of a of a wire with the like the the uh, electrical caps on the end. They're shot through and it's just just wire kind of hanging out and there's at the end of it this electricity that. That kind of played into that was a little symbolic i thought of of what willow was she's just kind of hanging out there she's sort of tore apart a little bit so i i love the location it was a great it was, it was a great spot and the to having everything together that must have really compressed your shooting your shooting schedule yes we shot in 14 days so um it really was very convenient for us because then we could move to one prep one one section of the warehouse for uh, shooting in the boarding house mm -hmm. and then in the other section of the warehouse we were prepping the probation officers off area and uh, it really turned out really well and uh, the other thing I wanted to add was that the um, that stairwell um, I've been I've had contacts with this warehouse for years um, for maybe the past 10 years and I've kept I've always wanted to shoot in the stairwell that metal, sh there's a metal shaft yes. of a stairwell um, and there was a not, uh, it was a freight elevator and it was um, not in use because it's illegal to use it because it hasn't been checked for years, mm -hmm. but it's just such a creepy part of the warehouse and that's where we had the upside down shot. Oh, I love that shot. Uh, yes, with the, and her walking down the stairwells there. That's, my goal was just, I wanted to shoot something in that, in that stairwell. Because it was just such a creepy stairwell. Oh, I am and so glad! I'm so glad you did it because that was my favorite shot. That was so cool. I want to steal that. I, I want to do that shot sometimes. That was so cool. So I am that. I'm, I'm glad. I, I'm glad that worked. That that worked out so well for you. That was beautiful. Yeah, uh, Thomas Billingsley, our director of photography, would be thrilled since that's the basically the entire film could go away. That was the shot that he designed. <laughs> And so it was very much, um, yeah, we, it was, uh, we were, uh, you know, I had a whole list of movies that I made him watch that were all these experimental Japanese films from the 1960s that were horror films that were, um, and one of them specifically, I think it's called, I think the, the English title is like Hell, but um, there was this really cool 360 shot in it. And uh, Thomas was like, I want to do a 360 shot. What can we do? And so that was, uh, that was actually um, inspired by that. And then we had access and he was able to design the shot around that. So he was like, if you cut, like you edit out my scene. <laughs> so I will I, kill you. <laughs> I personally come the, down, down, so. Was, oh, the, no, that, that, that was a beautiful shot. That was, that, that was, that, that was absolutely amazing. There's a lot of great shots in that, but the still on the location of, so, so the, uh, um, the, the, well, the studio, the artist studio, that must've been, that was on the, the other side of the warehouse. 
That was actually an artist studio. That like was a, an actual artist studio. Yeah. 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 We, yeah. The, the welding studio was actually one of the locations that we had. We had very few locations where we left the, stu- uh, the warehouse, but that was actually one of them. And so it was, um, it was that the tattoo parlor and the, obviously the external scenes, but it's interesting just because I think we tried to establish the, um, the geography of the warehouse in a certain way, but actually there's, um, there's some things that we played around with, like the stairs going down. We built a new set of stairs because again, that room of requirement is what I call that room of tires. Um, that was actually in a separate place altogether. And we had to make it look like it was actually part of like, again, we, the, you know, the, the warehouse and the studio was all, all there, but we played around a little bit with the geography. So you're a little lost as where, where things actually are in it. Okay. So, it, uh, Speaking about being lost. So a lot of this film from the, from the, speaking of your, your, your cinematographer. Um, oh, there's the kitty. <laughs> That's okay. he's, he's, he's joined in. <laughs> it, uh, mine, mine have, have still not made an appearance here. The, uh, <clears throat> but about the types of shots and the unease that was built. So there were, and I, I found that the, the cinematography made this entire film uneasy. And you, you eased into this story. And as you eased into it, we had this feeling of unease that the camera gave. There were um, a lot of handheld shots. There were some shaky shots. Uh, it always felt like someone was watching Willow and you were never like, as you could, until you get to the warehouse, this doesn't, like I found myself going, this is, this is supposed to be a horror movie, right? And that the horror didn't really come in until we got to that wonderful location in the warehouse and those beautiful, long, slow shots in in the warehouse were so different from some of the other shots that were a little bit shaky so that that difference that that shift it really piped the unease up um on on things i i found and there was always this feeling that willow as i said was being watched and you wondered who is watching her now we do know that eventually wolf was watching her and was hunting her but who else was watching her? There's a, there's a shot in the, to her room in the rooming house where it, the camera comes up and it, it, we, it just is kind of revealed. There's shots outside of the art of uh, the artist's studio through uh, like a pallet or a fence or something shot through that. They, they, those were, those were, were very interesting. And like I said, the long inverted shot on the stairs was just killer. Now, it lent, it lent a lot to the, uh, a dream versus reality thing, because so many of these the, these wonderful shots and the use of the locate the use of that great location came while Willow was tossing and turning in bed, and that real the like like what you said about your mother being uh, an insomnia uh, earlier the uh, the she was tossing and turning in her rooming house she was tossing and turning in the warehouse and the especially as we got to the warehouse, those feet. When I first saw the, the bare feet walking through the warehouse, I was like, is Willow sleepwalking or is that somebody else? And I, that, how you eased into that reveal that it really was Willow, that, that just kind of kept the unease of, is she in there alone? What is she? Um, speaking of her being alone, the face in the wall, <laughs> the, face, the face in the wall. Whose whose idea was the face in the wall? That was like that that was that was beautiful. That was uh, an evolution. That was from our. I I simply had like a scratching in the wall in the script, and um, our production designer Daryl Dusset came up with this. Like he had this idea, and I was like, oh yeah, we'll we'll just go for that. That is really that's really cool. And so again, it's nice when people kind of riff off of like the script is there. But people actually bring in hopefully better better ideas than the one that you had. <laughs> as part. But uh, going back to the uh, the framing, uh, when Thomas and I were going through the script, um, that, that was something that we really we wanted a palette for the film to begin with. Nothing is actually on sticks; almost everything is handheld. So that is actually part of it. I wanted a, a slightly documentary feel to, especially that beginning. But more, <clears throat> Willow was never properly centered in a frame. 
She is always slightly off. We always leave her off to the side. Um, and if she's not off to the side, we obscure the frame. Something is in the foreground. The idea that um, her world is always about being incarcerated. So even though she is ostensibly set free and is, you know, kind of like she's done her time, she's never escaped prison. That is always going to be it. And so it's a feeling of being watched, but also of being imprisoned. And so in that frame, she is constantly, um, we, we put her in jail over and over again. And so that was something that we consciously tried to do. And so um, there was always like, and, and Thomas is, um, we, we call him MacGyver, but he has a, basically this entire kit of things that he puts in front of the lens that would be, you know, just slightly obscuring. And so it was everything from plastic forks to, you know what I mean? Like whatever we could find to, to just put a little something on it and you didn't have to be in focus. But that way, you always get the feeling of not being able to quite see her in a comfortable way. And so that was uh, that that was designed from the from frame one pretty well. Uh, I want to swing back around with another um, change gears again, popping back and forth, trying not to talk about one thing over and over and over again. So um, the from from a budgeting standpoint was this was this did did you have uh, a good budget for this when I say good and any budget is good if we have money to make a movie we've got that that's good the but was it was it sufficient and we uh, did you have any budgetary challenges was it was it and did you come in on budget uh we are self-financed so there was no support yeah. Um, and part of it was a nail biter because we were counting on our tax credits money from another film, our previous film. So I was always on the phone with the, our accountants going like, and with CRA going like, when's our check coming? Cause I'm in production right now. I can really use it. And uh, yes, it was like constant sweating and uh, not really a good plan. Um, but we had this very small window where we had to shoot uh, in that uh, warehouse before it was rent tented, before there was a new tenant uh, moving in. So we had a, there was a, a vacate, uh, 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 someone vacated that building. And so we only had a short period of time to shoot within and we just went for it. And again, we tried to keep everything as um, uh, tight, like, financially cost saving as much as we could um, with shooting in one location, basically. Yeah. Well, like the, it's always like the, uh, the Star Wars, you know, the walls coming in. It's like, we'll lose this location if we don't shoot now, but we don't have the financing yet. Oh my God, we're gonna like, are we gonna do this? And so it's always the, yeah. The, it, uh, yeah, the, the, that, that, that part of producing, that's just, that's, that's, yeah, that, that's the scary part. <laughs> it is very scary, yes. Yeah. The nice thing is that once we're in production, Karen Wong keeps me completely in a bubble where I don't know what's going on in the best possible way. Because if I'm fretting about it too, that's the worst thing. It's like, because then, you know, the whole time I'm like, do we have any money? Like, can we do this? You know, like that's the, the last thing she wants me to be also freaking out about quietly. <laughs> That's excellent production, making sure make, making sure that you've got the freedom to be to be totally creative and just focus on those things. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. The it uh, the uh, going to I'm going to switch gears again. I think we've got oh, how many more minutes do we have? You're not uh, a few, but I, I want to get to I want to get to the creature. But before we get to the creature. I want to touch on one thing that's really cool, um, which kind of surprised me the first time I watched it and I paid extra special attention to it the second time was, here's Willow just kind of doing whatever there in the warehouse uh, and we get the doc who shows up um, and let's, hey, she's messed up. Let's give her some acid. <laughs> That was that was such a surprise to me. That uh, you had some you had some uh, had some stories about that uh, the background for that. You know, uh, it's interesting just because in um, I do a ton of research before every film. So even if it's just one line or some detail, uh, it often is something that I spent God weeks looking at. And actually, I've been looking a lot at microdosing and the idea of it on uh, the effect of microdosing, whether it's you know magic mushrooms. Um, Silo, silo, 
anyway, I can never say it right. Um, or, you know, LSD and just little low doses of it. And what it does is, and what they found is that in these low doses, it's actually more effective for a lot of people who are dealing with um, anxiety, stress, and, you know, depression in a way that um, our hardcore um, pharmaceuticals just don't do it. And so, but the problem is that so many of these drugs are still considered, you know, in that gray market zone, some of them are considered illegal, but the truth is that we, we really should be looking at them a little bit more. And so I had a girlfriend who was actually trying to get herself off of, um, the, all the various meds that she was on and she actually went with the microdose and it really was effective. And so after a couple of months, she was able to quit, like she quit the other stuff first, but this actually really helped her. And it was the first time that, um, I think she was on LSD and, um, again, at such low doses that that was, that was it. And so that was always something that I wanted to, again, this is the world that she lives in. And these are the types of conversations that she would be having. It's, um, and so that was something I wanted to make sure was in the, in the film. So it makes it seem like I'm a pusher. I'm not a pusher. <laughs> I, <laughs> it's like, I feel like Sam, I am all the time. You should try this. You know what? I have a pill for that. No, it's um, it's just interesting because again, sometimes in um, along with there are like the the social ideas of what you can and can't do. There's also a whole range of things that we're told that we can't do that actually might be actually beneficial for us. So on the one hand, you know, you've got these probation officers. And you know all the all the the constructs that are supposed to help her that are not helpful. And all the, on the other hand, there's things that you know are considered illegal and not supposed to be helping her that actually do help. So then there there we go. It's my upside down world that I literally have created, which I think is um, actually maybe truer than <laughs> than the than the world we think it is. Yeah, that, that could very well be. We have we have we have a question from our studio audience, so I feel very much I feel very much like Chris Hardwick here tonight. I I I, I thought that we should have had a logo or something, and I could have said, "Hi, this is Lair from the Talking <laughs> Wave." <laughs> you always feel watched, and I have a cat. Like I've he's, cats. He, yes, he, he, always, so it's like he's a wonderful cat. The, here's <laughs> our here's our audience question um, for 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 you, Karen Lamb. Uh, what was the most challenging? You th Thing, uh, that you faced with this film? You know, actually, it was probably post-production for us. It was the first time that Karen and I, like, usually there, it goes around in a, in a certain um, speed, but uh, the creature design took way, way, way longer than, um, you know, again, we shot in 2018, and we spent over a year in post for that. And so that was probably the, the hardest thing to, to get around. It was the, the shooting itself seemed to go quite smoothly, but our, the creature design took a lot, a lot, lot longer than we, than we thought. <laughs> I loved that creature. And I loved the welder's mask sinking into the smoke and then mm -hmm. Willow's face coming out. I loved that. I was Every probably- one of was literally months and months of discussion as you know, like they, they were, um, the original creature was based on uh, a girlfriend's art. She's a, she's a digital artist based out of Norway and she did our poster as well. But uh, she had this beautiful, weird, long limbed creature thing that was called the passenger. And I remember bookmarking it in my Instagram when I saw that, that picture It's always there in the back of my head. And we used that as our prototype to begin with. But then even how does the creature move? How does, you know, all of that sort of stuff is, is that, yeah, that took a, that was probably, again, the most challenging part. But also when I look at it, one of the, the things that I just think is lovely because it has nothing to do with me. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a challenge. It was a challenge well met. Uh, that was that, 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 that the, the creature comes across, uh, the, the creature comes across uh, spectacularly. Um, the, oh, we have another audience question. The, uh, uh, were you happy with the performances in your film? Yeah, I, I have to say again, um, I wrote the film for Val Tan, who is uh, Willow. Uh, we worked with her on a uh, web series and um, it was my first time working with her. And I was like, I would like to write a film for this woman. She just has the most beautiful, and expressive face that so much is going behind. And um, basically, uh, yeah, I, I'd say that I'm, I'm really, really happy with, again, most of the performers I've worked with on some level before, so it felt like a greatest hits as far as <laughs> bringing on the, on, the, on the team, but knowing where um, everybody's strengths were and pretty well those, creep, those characters were written for each of them, so. 
that makes it so much easier to direct them and to get the performances out because you you've written it in their voice. That's that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's always been, um, I mean, Karen and I, when I, I think the last auditions we actually had were for our former, like the film, the feature film before that, this, which was Evangeline. Um, that's the last casting session formally that I've had. Since then, my new process has really been to stalk you on Facebook and on, you know, on, on social media. I spend a lot of time watching people's work. Um, I'm lucky to be on so many juries where I watch other actors. So if it's someone that I haven't worked with, but sometimes they come across, you know, again, you're you're during a bunch of films and it could be a short film, it could be a student film. It's not like it's only, you know, I mean, like a set number of films that I watch every year. I try to watch as much as I can. And uh, usually I'm, I'm paying attention to like, oh, I really like that person's face. I love this performance. I love something about them. And uh, when when I'm writing, that's when I start putting in all the all the like the, the details and the nuances. It's like, oh, I need someone who does this. It's like, oh, I remember that person who was in this short film that I remember seeing that was really, really interesting. And so, yeah, it, it makes it a little easier because I'm not writing blank people. I'm actually writing people that are based on physical attributes and, and you know, basically characteristics that I've seen, so. Uh, uh, oh, Karen Wong, do you, and, and, and Karen, I have this question for, for both of you, like you, you've, you've uh, Karen, well, I guess Paul is more so maybe towards Karen. Do you work with other directors or uh, as well, or are you uh, are, are you and are, are you and Karen a team that uh, you you knock scary movies out of the park? Um, I do work with other directors, um, so I don't just only work with Karen. Um, but Karen and I are a, a very good team, and we have worked together for many many years. So twenty years now, Karen. Happy anniversary. Yes, <laughs> twenty years. There you go. That's that's wonderful. That's that, that's wonderful. It, it 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 is clearly an excellent uh, an, an excellent collaboration. So, um, I, I believe our time is up. So, um, I'd like to end this um, in a much better way than the ending of Poor Flea in the movie. <laughs> The, uh, I'd like to thank, thank, part of me wants to, wants to know what Flea saw and part of me doesn't, I just want to imagine it. But uh, the wrapping it up in a, in, in, a, in a more happy and more life lively method, uh, way than the, the ending of Poor Flea, I'd like to thank you both for taking the time to speak with me tonight and to share your thoughts with, uh, with our viewers online. Really appreciate it. And I look forward to, uh, I, I look forward to uh, ho hopefully seeing you again. And I look forward Karen to the, the to, to that the movie you mentioned uh, or that's that next project that you have in have in have in store I won't give any spoilers away <laughs> but I'm looking forward to that so thank you very much thank you very much for for spending some time with us this evening thank you all and to everyone that's with us online good night night all bye bye, bye.